The Booth Museum was the private museum of uh, Edward Booth, who was a Victorian ornithologist. An ornithologist in those days, if they were, you wanted to study birds, you needed to shoot them. But he was very rich and hit on the idea that he would like to collect the birds and stuff them and put them in cases. In the days of Victorian taxidermy, the problem was to preserve bird skins. And one of the ways they did it was to use arsenical soap. But it didn't do the taxidermists a lot of good. You might have heard of the Mad Hatter, uh, because people who made hats also used arsenical soap. Uh, arsenic is a slow-acting po slow poison, and uh, Mad Hatters went mad because of the arsenic. People don't talk about mad taxidermists, but I suspect they were all a bit mad too. Uh, behind the scenes we have a scientific specimen. So they're just bird skins, rather than being posed. They're just flat and they're just there so we can store them and for our research, for if scientists come in. Um, and we brought them out, didn't we, um, a couple of years ago to show the public, for them to help photograph them. And, and, and like, <laughs> they were on the same desk as like some stuffed <laughs> mounted ones on display posing and they were like, ah, oh, that's disgusting, these are all dead, that's vile, like, and we were like, you're just admiring yeah. that, that robin there that's dead. But it's just really It's the glass eyes, lacking yeah, glass is. eyes. You it think, is. oh, it's dead. Yeah. It completely changes. It does, people's reaction to it. Yeah. Some children will be more scared by things you wouldn't expect, like the bear will scare them. Um, but they can cope with a seagull pecking a sheep's eyes out, uh, whereas others really don't like that at all. Um, so generally I think children like nature and they're interested um, and they can cope with the fact that these are sort of dead creatures, they don't see them as, as dead um, and they can engage really well. It's quite, it's quite interesting to see how big things are, like the skeletons, like there's, a, there's like a massive swordfish back there, it's quite, quite big. Yeah, it's mad. We don't know too much about him. F.W. Lucas, he's the man who collected skeletons and the ones that we've got on display now. And it was just his hobby. And it went so far as him boiling up his two pet dogs. One's very large, one's very small. And it seems to be the obvious thing to do for him. It's our less glamorous yeah. collection. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the spirit collection is when they're preserved in alcohol. Um, so you've got, it's like where you see like the foetuses of animals. They're in a separate cupboard, so they're the least accessible. You have to treat them carefully because they're chemicals. We sometimes don't know which chemicals are in the jars as well. So, mm. And some of them are really, really hideous because they the animal fades. <laughs> or they've gone mouldy. So there's, there's a lot of horror. It's just a bit intimidating seeing yeah. the weasels all in a jar. Uh, some of things maybe are... Uh, creepy, but I like creepy things. Quite interested to look at them. They don't put me off. Okay. They're just body parts at the end of the day, aren't they? Stillborn Cyclops domestic cat. Yeah, there is only one eye. Yeah, but it's not in the middle, it's at the side. We work with an ethical taxidermist, and she only taxidermies things that have been uh, died naturally. But she did this remarkable job on the cheetah. So the cheetah had been given to the Booth Museum in the 1980s. It had died at Marwell Zoo. Um, and at that time, we had taxidermists on staff. And they prepared it, but they didn't have time to totally reanimate it, as it were. So they just skinned it and put its skin in a barrel of preservative. Mm. And there it stayed until about two years ago. Jasmine uh, was basically told it wouldn't happen, the skin would be far too fragile and the uh, hairs would probably fall out and it couldn't be done. There was no sort of known treatment, so she washed the preservative out of it and she had to use a pre-made former, so normally she'd make her own, you know, with wire and um, stuffing. You could sort of create it based on the animal's actual living dimensions, but she didn't have those because all she had was the skin, so she bought a former pre-made and, um, and sewed it up. It was a, it was a public engagement um, activity actually and there were evenings where people could put a little stitch in and say that they were part of the great stitch up. So that uh, yeah, cheetah is a kind of um, a marvel. My special area is keeper of geology. What I'm interested in is helping especially paleontologists, the fossil scientists, 
we're always reinterpreting fossils in the light of new discoveries. So people around the world want to come and see the specimens that I've got in the collections which have been published. And of course the public are always bringing us things to identify. About 20 years ago, a lady rang me and said she had a, a fossil she wanted to come and show me. I said, yes, bring it in, but can you give me an idea what, what it is? She said, yes, it's a fossil bird. So here's the piece of chalk and the flint that she found. She obviously saw a beak, a body and a tail of a bird. And however erroneously she thought, she thought it was enough to recreate by paint the rough outline of what she thought was a bird. Sad, really, that she was of that opinion and couldn't be persuaded. Uh, we've got a toad in the hole, which is a dried frog toad in a fossil flint nodule that people think is an example of how frogs and toads can survive for millions of years buried in rocks. All false, of course. The Wonder Women of STEM Discovery Day. So that was to celebrate International Women and Girls in Science. Teaching young girls about like there's these heroines in science like Rosalind Franklin, Mary Annin, these women who made a difference. Mary Annin discovered um, all of the major fossils on the Jurassic Coast. Um, so like the plesiosaurs and the ichthyosaurs, like massive like prehistoric reptiles that lived in the ocean. And that was a time at a time where women were only allowed to collect plants, you know. Yeah, like and most of our um, collection that has been actually collected by women, our records just show Mrs. Husband's first name, surname, so we don't even know who they were. We got four to five hundred thousand entomological specimens. They range from uh, the largest butterflies in the world, which are bigger than your hand, to really tiny bugs, true bugs. They are barely visible to the naked eye, but they're like a pinprick. So you can imagine they, if you balance one on the head of a pin, it would happily sit there. So the full range in, of sizes. So you have to be meticulous, organised, good attention to detail, really careful. Butterflies are very delicate, they've got lots of bits that stick out, like legs and things which you might forget when they're hidden beneath the wings. But I was going to say a head could just roll off. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah. Sometimes you get ping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there goes another that, leg. That doesn't happen often. <laughs> no. no. You can glue them back on, it's fine. Yeah. The Smithsonian have called us the home of the diorama. The idea was taken by natural history museums in America and they've really gone to town with them. So if you go to the Natural History Museum in New York, they've got some really grand diorama displays. And that all comes from uh, Booth's original ideas. One of the things that Mr Booth did that was special was he's known as the father of the diorama. In those days, most people who killed and stuffed birds just put them on perches and lined the perches up in cases. But his idea was to recreate the natural surroundings in which the birds live. And so he built cases, glazed cases with a glass front and tried to produce a sort of pretend environment that looked like the environment in which the birds had lived. We do have one or two birds that are extinct. We have the eggs of the passenger pigeon, which is an extinct bird from North America. Um, and these all go to teaching lessons to people about extinction rates. It's really cool because we are seeing like animals I've never seen before. Yeah. It's like uh, dodo. Uh, yeah, thing. the dodo. Yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah. It's really cool. The idea of collecting and killing birds today to just to put on display is quite abhorrent to me. But the amount of damage caused to wild populations by Booth would have been minimal, especially when you consider the feather trade, which was at its height at that time. The only thing more valuable than feathers in the late 1800s was diamonds. And uh, you had people collecting for the fashion industry, causing the extinctions of birds such as the passenger pigeon, which they wiped out.
And even Booth himself writes about how abhorrent the feather trade is when he observes people standing on the cliffs at Beachy Head shooting at the kitty wakes flying over to, sh to kill the birds to collect the feathers and describing injured birds drowning in the sea. And a few years after that, the RSVB was set up specifically to stop that, that type of collecting of birds. So natural history museums might seem an awful waste of life, but at least they were collected for a purpose, as opposed to what happened to most of the birds shopped for the fashion industry.